today. My name is Jolene Olson. I'm a partner and the administrative director for the Factor Service. We are delighted to bring you this series, A Market Wizards Dialogue. Our ser series first began in November with Peter Brandt interviewing Jack Schrager about his new book and his project Fun Seater. I put a link to that recording in the comment section. Please copy and save this to listen later. Today the tables will be turned and Jack will interview Peter and he'll give insights on 40 plus years of trading and what's on the horizon for him and the factor service. And now it's my pleasure to welcome Peter Brandt and Jack Schwager. Hey Jack. This is Jack Schwager. Hey, hey Peter, how are you? Thanks Jolene. Uh, okay, so today I get to sit back and let you do the work, Peter. Um, <laughs> It's it's a lot of work asking good questions, Jack, and you've been you you you've uh, you perfected that over the years. Thanks. Well, we'll find out. What was the worst trading mistake you ever made? Something that's seared in your mind and and uh, presumably uh, maybe impacted your trading uh, methods afterwards. Oh, I think just getting stubborn. Uh, I, I, I getting getting stubborn with the trade, not putting in a stop and. You know, that's happened a couple times. It doesn't happen anymore because I'm more disciplined about placing you, orders. Was there any trade that had a uh, such a um, visceral impact that you still remember that trade today? Oh, ouch! Uh, yeah, uh, the start of the Gulf War in the early '90s. Uh, I got I got handed. Uh, I think I may be a little wrong on prices. Uh, but it was uh, crude oil had gone out, and it was a January crude oil had gone out somewhere around 27, 28 bucks a barrel, and uh, I was long at the time, and you know I'm sitting in my kitchen up in northern Minnesota, and the U.S. starts bombing uh, Iraq, and uh, you know I made a few calls back then. We didn't have overnight orders markets, but we had what was called the curb, which was kind of an illegal overnight market that you actually could trade. And so I call London and I say, you know, where's the curb on crude? And I think at the time crude was up three bucks, something like that, you know, so went out at 28, straight at 31, 32, and I'm thinking, man, this is, tomorrow is going to be wonderful, right? And so by the time it came in in the morning, it was a, it was a buy the rumor, sell the fact thing, and uh, crude oil not only had erased the three dollar advance it had taken on the London curb, but actually came in like uh, eight bucks lower. And so uh, I ended up selling my long crude oil position for like ten, eleven bucks off of the London high. That was the largest single trade I ever took, and I, I don't know if I'd you know done anything different necessarily, but it it's sure a trade that still sticks in my crawl. But actually, that was sort of an overnight move, so there really wasn't anything you could have done about it, right? No, there's nothing I could have done about it, but it was painful. Right, right. But so there wasn't, it wasn't like, actually, that's an example of, it wasn't necessarily, <laughs> it was a horribly losing trade, but it wasn't a bad trade, right, in that sense? No, you, there, 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 was been a trade, there was a trade in wheat where I just felt like, you know, I knew the fundamentals and... Uh, you know, uh, I, I, it, we can't go any lower, and you know, I'm not going to use a stop, and it's, you know, this is as cheap as wheat's going to get, and I could, I could take delivery in wheat and sprinkle it on my driveway when it's icy. I mean, it, it's so cheap, uh, and uh, and I added to the loser feeling that, hey, you know, uh, it it can't go any lower, and it did go lower, and I. I added to a loser along the way, and and probably took about a 10% hit on my capital. And uh, um, you know, nothing is so cheap that it can't can't go any cheaper, and nothing is so expensive that it can't go any higher. Right. So so basically, it was one of those times where you violated. You, you basically uh, just were stubborn about getting out. You just continued to stay. Yeah, and I think what I've learned from that, Jack, the, 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 the general trading guideline is, uh, is what I call the catching falling knife thing. As, uh, guys that try to pick the bottom, that's like catching a falling knife. If they don't grab it just right and they miss the handle, guess what? Uh, it, it, it hurts, and, you know, or, or it's like catching the firing, firing bullet right at at the apex where it stops going up. I mean, if you don't time that right. And so I have no desire in trying to 
pick bottoms and pick tops. How long uh, ago was that trade, out of curiosity? That was probably uh, late 80s. Right. And, right. So and, and, and I suppose ago. that helped reinforce that helped reinforce the 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 rules about just getting out when when you start losing. Yeah, and you know, I think there's there's an additional dimension to that. Is I think that as you learn to trade and you make mistakes, you you, you tend to have a hunch, but sometimes you're not able to articulate what that is until you, you gain a little time distance on it. Uh, and, and I think for me it was I don't want to catch tops and I don't want to catch bottoms. And I think what it led to was an understanding that I play best when I play between the 30-yard lines is that I, 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 you know, comparing it to football, American football, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be engaged in the game in the red zone. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a between the 30-yard line player. I want to catch the move somewhere in the middle. I don't necessarily want to catch it at the bottom. I don't want to necessarily get out at the top. I, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable catching it, uh, playing it in between and, and and that's that's my game. And uh, I know when I get out of that game, it, it usually doesn't have very good results. And so I try to stay. And I always ask myself, uh, you know, I, I'm a pilot, and so I'm used to checklists, right? I'm used to uh, all the things you need to do before you you get in your airplane and you you take off from the runway. There's a ton of things you have to do, and you know, there's a lot of things I need to think about when I put on a trade, and uh, you know, the main thing is, what am, how am I going to get out if I'm wrong? I mean, that's the single biggest question you need to ask on a trade: is I'm going to put it on, but how am I going to get out if I'm wrong? And, uh, and and so I'm always conscious of certain dimensions of a trade, dealing with sizing and entry and the orders and uh, what's my composite risk in highly correlated trades, and you know all that stuff comes with time. I mean, you don't, you don't, you know, uh, a, a trader needs to, particularly a discretionary trader. Systematic trading is a different world, but for a discretionary trader, I seek progress, not perfection. Right. Now you talk about knowing when you get out before you get it, yeah, uh, in, which is really important. Uh, but the question I have for you, Taines, I know you, you have the factor and. Uh, you have an advisory service and all that, and you're putting out specific trade recommendations, which is one thing, but more importantly, I guess specific recommendations about, uh, or specific enough about where to get out or how to get out. Uh, and I was wondering if there was any concern about, it, by doing that, if you have enough people doing the same thing, following you, if that increases the chances of your getting stopped out of trades where you might not have gotten stopped out if it was just you trading on your own, nobody knowing what you're doing. No, you know, I don't think so. I, I don't think that the volumes out there, I think those, you know, I, I started the factor as kind of a uh, offering my view of the markets in January of 2014. I mean, part of that, no, but, uh, you know, that that's when I started actually publishing my thoughts about markets. And I only really provided a very, very specific recommendation one time. Uh, Jack in the last three years, and that was a that was a trade dealing with a euro dollar spread here a, a couple months ago, where I said you need to do it, you need to do it here, you need to do this size, you need to get out here. Here's where you take profits. Here's where you're wrong. Uh, you know, I've only really done that once, and I and I have no idea how many people have participated, and, and never really will know. Although the euro dollar, and I'm talking about the interest rate market, not the currency. That's so thick that there's, you know, I you can do a thousand at the market and not move the market there. So I right, right. So you're not, so you're not providing specific, you know, specific enough stops where everybody stops are going to be in the same way. No, I mean I do announce it every, and on, on every Saturday I, uh, I will tell people here's my book and here's, uh, here's my sizing per some unit of capital and here's where my stop is whether it's a 24-hour stop or end of day stop or you know but here's the level at which I I, I, I say I'm wrong and here's where I think the market's going to go and I, so I you do putting out your, you are putting out your exact stop then yeah I do I do I do list that now it can change it can change by, by Sunday night I, I mean you know once markets open on Sunday it's all fair game and I I, I, I approach the trade management in what I would define as an active and aggressive manner. I, 
I don't put an order in and put a stop in and forget about it. Uh, you know, I, 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 I am aggressive and active in, in attempting to uh, manage a trade that has a profit. Uh, you know, if there's that fine balance, and you know what it is, Jack, between uh, not letting the market come all the way back at you and, and allowing it to run. I mean, that's, uh, and sometimes you're right in making decisions on that, and sometimes you're wrong, and guess what? That's all part of the game. But I, I, I do try to actively manage uh, a trade and find ways where I can say, okay, I'm going to advance my stop here at this point. And sometimes it's uh, one day into a trade, sometimes it's three weeks into a trade where you can make that judgment. But I do want to make that judgment when I can. Right. Uh, the, um, we've talked a lot about the, the risk side. Um, uh, let's go a little bit about, you know, even though it's secondary, but trade entry. Uh, do you have some favorite types of setups? Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you do a lot of different types of trades, but in, for 40 plus year trading career, do you, do you have trades that uh, that uh, are ones which you really uh, yeah. find most reliable or favorite, so to speak? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I do not like what what I define as a diagonal pattern, and a diagonal pattern is 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 a, a chart configuration whereby the market breaks out of a boundary line that that is slanted, uh, as such as the case of a symmetrical triangle or a wedge. I I, uh, I I have no real use for trend lines, although every once in a while when you combine them with a pattern, they they can give you some insight. But a trend line is a diagonal uh, boundary. Uh, and so I like head and shoulders patterns with flat necklines or necklines that are slanted in the direction of, of the breakout I'm anticipating, but never against the direction of the breakout uh, that, uh, that I'm anticipating. I like right angle triangles, as descending triangles and ascending triangles, and I like rectangles. Those, uh, th those are my favorite patterns. Uh, I like those patterns that are very well defined, that you know, that that are not subject to two or three different. Well, it could be this, but it might be that. Uh, you know, that that I can look at it and say, I know exactly what this is. Uh, there's no question about what this is. Uh, I have to be an idiot if I can't figure out what this is. I, I like those patterns, and I like them to be between 10 and 26 weeks in duration. I, I will periodically trade a shorter pattern if it is a pennant or flag in the direction of, uh, of a trade I've already got on, and, and I use it to try to you know, elevate my leverage by just a little bit. Uh, and I'll trade longer patterns. You know, I'll trade patterns that are a year, two-year patterns, but they're more difficult. It, it's the timing of a, of a one-year head and shoulders is very different than the timing of an 18-week head and shoulders, and so I like I like what I call horizontal patterns that are somewhere between uh, one quarter and two quarters in duration. Uh, that for me, though, that's my bread and butter. There are really four things that I try to accomplish and provide with the factor service. You know, most people uh, deal in what I call trade identification or trade signals, which I think are quite frankly, about the least important thing to uh, successful market speculation. Uh, trade identification, of course, has to be done, but that's the emphasis most people will place on, on a service where they're providing information by the market on the markets to, to subscribers. And I really wanted my focus to be on the things that really mattered, and that is really things that I've learned uh, over the years from making mistakes. Uh, traders learn by making mistakes and, and it's those things that I wanna, wanted to uh, focus on. First, I wanted to focus on the pure principles of classical chart uh, charting as written by Richard W. Schaubacher in the 1930s. I see many charts on social media and I, I don't really recognize what they are. They, they do not comply with the classical charting principles in the truest sense. And so I wanted really a service that represented uh, the best of classical charting principles. The second thing I really wanted to address was risk management. Uh, people give lip service to risk management. 
but risk management is the most important aspect to market speculation. And uh, I use aggressive and active risk and trade management, and uh, people really have no idea what that is. And I, I want it in real life, on, uh, focusing on the trades that I do to really give examples of what risk management is. Uh, the third thing is just dealing with trading as, as a business. Uh, the process of trading, you know, people uh, trade who are, are businessmen and in their business professions they do uh, planning, they have processes and practices that are established as part of their businesses, but then they turn on trade and they do it haphazardly. And uh, trading really needs to be approached in a very systematic and organized way with checklists and doing the same thing on the same date. You know, I know uh, what I'm going to be doing uh, the second Tuesday of uh, July, two years from now, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, because that's how refined my trading is as a process. And then the final thing was just the human aspect of market speculation. You know, trader is his own worst enemy. You've heard me talk about that before, and it's true. Successful trading is really an up stream swim against human nature and uh, traders need to understand that that it's really primarily their own emotions or fear and greed and false hope that are the things that they need to battle with in the process of becoming a successful trader. Have you changed, well, excluding your early trading period, um, have, have you changed your trading in any significant ways? You know, from the point where you already were an experienced trader with a methodology, uh, but from that point on, have you made at some point any significant changes? And if so, what were they, and why were they? Yeah, I think there are a couple. There are a couple. I mean, one is uh, higher selectivity on patterns. You know, I used to trade if it. You know, I used to take the attitude that if it looks like a duck, it's a duck. You know, I mean, so I would trade 30 times in a month. Uh, you know, I could identify uh, 25 to 30 patterns uh, that I would trade. Uh, I didn't have any restrictions on it needs to be this pattern, that pattern, it needs to be this duration or that duration. Uh, and so I'd trade it. Uh, and I would tend to let a market come all the way back on me, what I'd call a popcorn trader, a round tripper, uh, where I'd get in and you know, I would run 50% to the target and turn around and come all the way back and slam me at my initial risk point. Uh, and so the one change is to more selectivity in patterns, which has resulted in fewer trading uh, occasions. You know, I, I, I try to keep trading occasions down to, you know, one a week, sometimes two a week. I, I just find that uh, uh, if I, it's, I mean, sure, there are times when maybe you get poor signals in a week. I mean, I, I got a bunch of signals yesterday. Uh, I got three good signals yesterday. And so, uh, but that's unusual. And so I'm always conscious of the fact that am I, am, am I reading too much into a pattern to, just because I want to trade? Uh, or is it, this a real signal? And then I think the change is that I'm just not willing to let a market popcorn on me. I mean, if a market uh, starts reaching 30%, uh, 50%, and especially 70% of the distance to where I think it's going to go, I, I really clamp down the hatches and will not let a market come back against me. I think the other thing is I used to pyramid. I mean, I put a, uh, let's say, a trade on. And if it started working, I wanted more. Uh, and so I'd try to find ways to get more. Uh, where now I, I would say that I, re I, I, uh, I, I reverse pyramid. I actually, uh, I will start getting out of a, of a trade as it progresses. And I, uh, more often than not, I'll lighten up on a trade. Periodically, I will extend the leverage on the trade. But more likely than not, I, I start stripping off a trade. Uh, a week into the duration of the trade, usually I'm looking to start coming out of maybe a third of my position. I won't put that back on. Uh, I mean, so I only get lighter. I don't get heavier. I just found that uh, pyramiding I don't think is a good idea. My experience is having a smaller position more often than not can be more profitable than having a bigger position because you start big and getting too big a position, 
and then you find that it just fairly insignificant reactions in the market all of a sudden will put a put an entire position into trouble where if a person uh, puts on something and tends to want to just keep it on or start taking it off uh, it's it's easier it's easier to withstand uh, the the smaller reactions that the market will have. Right, like I like to say, if your position is if you trade too big, then you get to the, then your fear will dominate your decision process instead of reason, and uh, and and that's that's where a lot of people go wrong. Yeah, um, you bet. That's absolutely right, Jack. Um, let's uh, let's talk about. Uh, you know, traders and what traders do wrong. What, what do you think? And I've got to be, we could spend whole whole webinar on this <laughs> question, but but let's just narrow it just the most the high the high points. What do you think the worst mistakes traders make? Well, I I, I mean I think that the dynamic as a trader today has a little bit different profile than a trader back when I started. Uh, I mean, you have a lot of people who hear about. Uh, the, the big money that you can make trading. I keep a whole file, and uh, the, the the name of the file is scammers. Uh, a whole file of emails that come out, and stuff that I see in the internet by by bloggers who are, you know, double your money every three months trading options. Uh, uh, all of this nonsense. I think it's it, it's a non-regulated industry to that degree. If 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 a promoter is not a member of the National Futures Association, and so uh, that that draws in uh, the attractiveness is somebody who's uh, they're going to be a trader, they're going to become a trader, and there are certainly a lot of people out there that can will sell them on the idea that it's easy, and and so they come in and they come in with the wrong expectations, they come in. Uh, expecting this is something I can double my money at least every year on. Uh, that's a that, that's just a bad assumption to begin with. They come with the idea that there's easy money, that it's easy. All I have to do is follow this guy's system or buy this guy's program or uh, spend three thousand dollars to be trained by somebody who's never really traded in their life. Uh, and so that there's bad expectations. And then I think. The other thing is that their focus is on how much money am I going to make, uh, where I think your focus is is on how long you want to last. I, I mean, structure your trading, if you're a young guy, structure it so that you can still be in the game 30 years from now and not how you maximize your profits in the next year. And I think over time, just the compounding nature of money uh, is is where is where the edge is. It's not uh, how 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 can I triple my money this year? There, there there's too much. And I, I think the other there are a couple other errors. I think they make they overtrade. Uh, they oversize their position if they're trading futures. You know they 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 look at soybeans and they've got a twenty thousand dollar account and they figure I can do four contracts. You know, uh, you know, I'll trade one contract of soybeans for hundred thousand dollars in capital. Uh, that to me is proper sizing. So they overtrade. They, they oversize and they overtrade, and they think they can day trade. I, we can do a whole webinar on how difficult it is to actually make money day trading, Jack, and maybe for another day. But the odds are so stacked against somebody day trading because their competition are the high frequency traders. They are uh, the artificial intelligence programs. They are the quants. They've got to beat those guys to make money day trading. I don't have to. Uh, and then I think uh, the, the, another big mistake they make is they they don't really know what a signal is to them. They, they can't really define this is my trade. And until they can define and look and say, this is my trade. It's at that point that actually how the hard work starts. And so they come in and with a lot of bad assumptions. They're undercapitalized. They have bad expectations. They want to follow somebody else. They're not willing to pay the price in terms of time. It takes three to five years to actually become competent as a trader. They want it now. And uh, and, and so I think those, from my perspective, are the big mistakes novice or aspiring traders make. Yeah, that's a good list. Uh, let's go back to charts for a moment. Uh, time frame of charts. What, what is your process? That you, you know, you can have monthly, weekly, daily, intraday, so forth. Do you, do you go through all the time? Do you start? Do you start for the longest and go to the shortest? How do you, how do you actually 
do the chart analysis across the time frames. Okay, I, I mean, I trade in futures, I trade global futures, you know, and that can be anywhere from corn to uh, the Kospi to uh, the Nifty 50 in India. I mean, I, I trade the globe. Uh, it's, uh, I, I trade uh, uh, Forex crosses as long as one major is included. Uh, I mean, I don't want to trade uh, South Africa, Brazil. I mean, that's not a trade I'd ever do. Uh, I mean, so I want to. I want at least one primary to primary, or primary to secondary. I don't trade the exotics, and so I have a list of maybe 80 or 90 markets that are in my universe. And starting Friday at around noon, I start scrolling through the weekly charts of all of those vehicles. And uh, obviously, I'm very interested in those in which I have a position. Uh, I mean, those get flagged. And so I have three levels of flagging. That's the full list, which then goes to the secondary list, which is anything that's caught my attention that, you know, obviously, if I'm in a position, that immediately goes to my short list. But, you know, I, if there's a pattern that is of particular interest to me, I'm monitoring it. I know that there's a signal coming up. I'm very interested in the trade. Uh, that goes to my secondary list, and then that means that by Saturday morning, I've looked at not just the weekly chart, but the daily chart and probably the monthly chart. And, uh, and, and then if it's a pattern that I feel like, okay, this is a mature pattern, uh, and I, boy, I, it's, it's, I have a sense that a pattern is mature or a pattern has work yet to do. And, you know, again, that's a judgment that sometimes right is sometimes wrong, but over, you know, uh, uh, trading these markets over the course of five different, in five different decades, I've come to a pretty good idea of a ripe, mature pattern versus a pattern that's immature. And so uh, if it's a mature pattern, I, then I have to, by Sunday afternoon, determine whether it's going to be a market that I'm going to have an order for. And so Sunday I'm determining... I'm determining markets in which I will actually have orders placed because I view myself not as a trader, but as an order placer. I mean, I'm, that, that's my job. I place orders, and that's what I do for a living is I place orders. And, you know, that's a, not a glamorous view of a trader, but that's the reality. And so, you know, I have to determine sizing. I have to determine, okay, at what point do I think, uh, I, and I use a lot of alerts. I put in alerts for every price that I have for entry or what's going to trigger. I have alerts, and all my alerts email me or text me. And so, uh, from from three different platforms that I trade from. And so, uh, and then Sunday afternoon, markets start opening three o'clock Mountain Time. I start putting in orders if I need to have orders in overnight. And then, of course, Monday morning I use a lot of day orders, so I have to repeat those every week. But I pretty much by Sunday decided on the markets that are on my short list. And those are markets in which either I have a position and need to manage it, or maybe two or three markets that I think, okay, something could happen to these markets this week that's going to give me, that's going to trigger action on my part. And then during the week, then it's just a matter of every day, at, at usually starting around 2.30, 2.45 my time, I start looking at daily charts. I mean, at that point in time, I've already, I've already screened markets based on weekly charts. And so then during the week, Monday through Thursday, starting around 2.30, I start looking at daily charts. Is there something that developed in this chart this day that I'm not in where maybe I adjust how I'm going to get in? Uh, it's a market that I'm in. Where's the opportunity to move a stop? And so that's the process. And then, of course... So it sounds like the real bulk, I, I don't know, percentage of it, the way you're describing it, it sounds like probably 50% plus of your work is uh, done on, after the Friday close before the Sunday night opening, and yep. the other 50% will be apportioned across each day of the week. Uh, would that be a fair kind of uh, Yeah, assessment? Yeah, I, put, I, I build the blueprint on the weekend and, ex, and, and, and do the plumbing and electricity during the week, right? I mean... Yeah, the, would you ever... Uh, you know, you decide on your major trades and over the weekend. Might you pick during the week a trade that wasn't on your list and that didn't pop out to you on the weekend, but something on a daily chart, daily review uh, makes you notice it? And do sometimes new trades 
yep. evolve intra week, you know, during the week as opposed to over the weekend? Uh, oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I try to minimize those, Jack, because I, I, you know, I'm always concerned. Okay, is this trade all of a sudden on my list because I'm being drawn in by volatility? Uh, which, by the way, is you know, I, I don't mean to say volatility is always bad. In fact, I love volatility when I'm on the right side of it. But yeah, and so th th there'll, there'll be charts in which maybe I, I know I want to do it, but I don't know exactly how. I mean, for me, uh, the, the euro currency was a great case this week where I had a feeling that I was hoping it wasn't going to break out this week, but it did. Uh, it broke out last night. Uh, I, I was hoping it was going to drift sideways through the first day of January. and. That was my wish, but markets don't always comply with our wishes. And so I was prepared to do something. And periodically there will be something that will occur that grabs my attention that I hadn't even thought about over the weekend. But I, I really do try to uh, be very deliberate in minimizing those. Well, yeah, I'm reminded when you talk, when you said that, like I'm reminded of sort of a – that you should do what you what you know the markets will do rather than what you hope they will do. And I was wondering why having uh, an obvious opinion that the euro is going to break down, why you were waiting for January? Why not have just acted before then? Well, I was in it. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I, I had a position. I, I came in with a position. Uh, I came in the last night long the dollar index and short the euro currency. And uh, those are positions that, you know, that have gone back several weeks. Uh, but they weren't the original position I had on. I mean, there were positions in which I had taken profits. Uh, there were positions in which I, I, I put on in early, uh, in early October, uh, early November, and got out of in, in early December. And, but I still held a core position and actually... Right, but, but if, so if you were already short, why, why were you hoping that it would go sideways longer? Well, because there, there, in currencies, in the euro currency, there's something called a January effect. Uh, in the euro currency, is one of the most dependable seasonal uh, uh, markets that I trade. As a matter of fact, Jack, if you go back to the very beginning of what can you can identify as a euro currency, and of course, the euro currency doesn't go back except for you know, t uh, 13, 14 years. But before that, there's a bushel basket of currencies that were trade weighted, you know, the Deutsche Mark, uh, Fred Frank, right. and so forth. So you, so you can really chart the euro currency back to 71. Well, since 71, the euro currency has made its annual high or low in January 78% of the years. And if you include the first two weeks of February, it's made its high or low in the year. 85, 86% of the time. So it's a very dependable thing. And so I've, I've had the, a bias that the euro currency was going to get tanked. Uh, I've had that for some time. And what I was hoping is that uh, the market could hang on and, uh, you know, I could sell a rally the first couple of days of January and instead kind of being forced into uh, selling a break here. I don't have as big a position as I wanted to, but I at least right. respected the chart. Right, right. In other words, you were still expecting a long-term down, a long downtrend in the euro, and more likely if that occurred off a, ra a rebound rather than off of a uh, yeah. you know, near move. We got you. Uh, after such a long career of trading, uh, do you still have do you have goals that you're still trying to meet or? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, uh, my goal is to get out. Uh, I mean, I've, I've committed to my wife that December of 2019 will be the last month I trade. Um, and uh, and I, I got a feeling she's going to stick me with that one. I mean, being married to a trader is never an easy thing for a, for a spouse to be. I mean, it's, 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 a challenging, it's a challenging thing as a spouse. And uh, you know I'm you know I'm you know I'm gonna, I'm a month away from being 70 years old. Uh, my grandkids are of the age where I think I can really enjoy them. I'm, I'm not a I, I enjoy grandkids when they get a little older. And uh, you know so I I I'm fully 
uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fully committed to the idea that I'm done really talking about markets. I may put on periodic trades, but in terms of having any sort of public presence at all, uh, I'm done in December of 2019. Uh, I've got a commitment to finish a book for John Wiley and uh, with, a, with, with a submittal date of March of 2020. And uh, that book will feature what I consider to be the best chart patterns that form the final years of my trading. And uh, well, I look forward to, to seeing that one. That, I'm sure that'll be very illuminating uh, for anybody yeah. using. So um, that, that's kind of where it is. And so that that's my near-term goal. And I just want to finish with excellence. You know, I want to. Uh, I'm, I'm committed to try to pass on some knowledge to people. And you can't pass on the information that deals with specifics of a trade, but you can certainly pass on lessons. Peter, uh, I'm cognizant that we've actually run over an hour and a half, which I'm not surprised. Uh, let me, I just want to finish, uh, I'm two, about two questions uh, left and sort of keep them to the point. One, I want to give you an opportunity. It's interesting, I uh, sometimes, you know, you, you tweet stuff and I retweet it, and, uh, and one, I forgot exactly what the comment was, but I really liked the, uh, I really, uh, yeah, I think it was the one where you could repeat the phrase, it's one of the probabilities and possibilities. You can repeat that so people know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And uh, then the comment I had was, uh, why are you quoting? Why are you quoting uh, uh, Peter Brandt? I mean, you know, he sends me something like where you were predicting uh, oh, years ago that the stock market was uh, was going down and then it's going up like 100% since then. And, and <laughs> I kind of I kind of know what the answer is going to be, but uh, I'll, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate here, so uh, I'm, I'm giving you an opportunity to sort of respond to that because I I know people misinterpret what you do. Oh, and, they do. And what, it, and what it takes to be a good trader. So let's start with that that little saying, which I thought was actually a very good one. And then why don't you answer this? Uh, well, why the hell am I quoting somebody who's who is like uh, talking about the market having a bear, big bear market when it was half the price it is now? Talking yeah. About stock. I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I go by a, a, a philosophy, Jack, which I call strong opinions with the hill. And when I see a pattern that I think is 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 a good tradable pattern, I you know I'm committed to that pattern. I believe strongly in that trade, and it's only I know that it's only when I do believe strongly in that trade that I can put on the size that that actually is meaningful, and that I can stay with the trade if it's going my way. If I don't believe strongly in a trade. It's tough to stay with the trade, and so I need to believe strongly in the trade, and so that's a strong opinion. But the minute it reaches into my pocket, it becomes a weakly held opinion. It's opinion that I'll drop like a hot potato, and so sometimes I'll I'll, I'll throw out a tweet on a, on a chart that I think is very very interesting, and it may not be a chart that I'm even involved in. It may just be that hey, here's a pattern in a, in in a chart in a market, and I may not even have a position. I think some people assume that I have a position in that market. It's not necessarily true. Um, it's just I'm interested in patterns when they form, and I let people know, hey, here's a pattern. Uh, and so I, I can change my mind. I mean, I, I just, and I think sometimes in the Twitter world, changing your mind becomes something that that people become offended by is weren't you just bearish on that market? Now you're bullish on that market. When in fact, what I said that was bearish might not have been a short position at all. It was just an observation. And uh, and but I I think flexibility and the ability to change your mind is is actually uh, that's actually a very very strong attribute for good trading. Is you got to be willing to change your mind. It's actually a necessity, I think, for you for got this. it. And in the process, in the Twitter world, in the blogosphere world, I think sometimes uh, people read you wrong, and they may view that as a negative. That you know, didn't you just say something bullish about such and such a market? Now you're saying something bearish about such and such a market. Just this last week, you know, we completed a head and shoulders in the crude oil on the weekly chart. We didn't do it decisively. We did it very, very weakly. I mean, it was a terrible pattern completion. But I pointed out that it, it, there was a head and shoulders bottom. 
And I think the next day, you know, the, the breakout failed and slammed back into the pattern. And the next day I made the observation that the commitment of traders data is extremely negative. And so, you know, that when I do that, I guess I offend people. Oh, well, that's breaks. I mean, I just, uh, you know, so be it. I mean, I mean, it's not an inconsistency for me. And if it's an inconsistency for somebody else, that's their problem, not mine. Well, you're you you know you're basically in the, in the risk management business, not in the forecasting business. Oh, I'm not, and I don't believe that charts actually do forecast, Jack. I mean, I you know people say, well, charts are unreliable, and I'll be the first one to say, yeah, yeah, they sure yeah. are. Uh, it, you know, charts tell you where market's been, and it'll tell you, uh, it, it'll give you an idea of where the path of least resistance is. But it, it, uh, charts do not forecast, and. I think there's a real danger when people start thinking about charts in terms of forecasting. I, that's not what charts are good at. Charts for me are wonderful for finding specific spots where there's an asymmetrical risk to reward uh, trade, and, uh, and 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 that's it. And so I'm not offended when I lose on a trade. I'm not. I, as a matter of fact, my win rate, Jack, historically is 40, 41 percent. So my default attitude is my next trade is going to be a loser. Right. And um, okay. that's a strange idea for novice traders. I mean, they expect winning trades. I expect losing trades. And that allows uh, me to be a good money manager. Okay, so like, since we've run so long, I'm going to just one last question. Now, we've talked about a lot of your sort of trading rules in the course of this conversation, but I want to give you an opportunity. Are there any trading rules that we haven't already talked about that you think are important? Um. Well, I, I think it, it yeah, uh, I mean, I think you have to seriously examine yourself if you're going to be a day trader. I mean, so that's that's kind of a general broad stroking rule. You got it. I think someone that's going to be a debate day trader really needs to understand the odds are so stacked against you. It's unbelievable. And uh, I, I would I would say that uh, anyone who is a position trader and tends to hold positions, if they go back and say, if they would have never taken a trade that was uh, in opposition to just a simple moving average, I mean, just name it, you know, 10 day, 15 day, 20 day moving average. I'm not big in optimizing moving averages or, you know, this is bad. just a simple 14 day moving average. That I'm only going to take a position if it's supported by a 14 day moving average. And if they were to go back in their years of trading and say, if I would have held to this rule, would I have been better off or worse off? Uh, I, I think for a discretionary position trader, 98% of them would say that is a good rule. Okay. Any others or before we wind us up? Um, uh, the trader's job is to, uh, you know, take losses. I mean, that's that's something that was taught to me by the mentor that I mentioned earlier is, he would tell me uh, my his job is to take losses and let the winners worry about themselves. But his job is to take losses. And if you focus on your job is to cut your losses short uh, and let winners take care of themselves. In the long run, I think that's a, that that'd be a, a a good attitude to have in trading. Okay, actually, I lied about the last question. Your last answer. Um, you talked about like just having the short-term trend in your favor. I'm wondering if, it, as it might pertain to your equity curve, do you ever, uh, do you think there's any value in sort of plotting your equity curve and and when the trend on your equity curve is going down, to to take that as a signal to lighten up? Um, I, I don't follow equity day to day, so that's not real fitting for me, Jack, because I don't pay attention to open trade profits. Uh, I only pay attention, I do do an equity curve, but it's only on the basis of uh, sequential closed trades. Is That's what I'm looking at, and I, and I plot that. And I do know when that turns down and I don't have, and I happen not to have some good open profits that, are, that, that, that will be booked later, I, I know for me that's, that's time to really start cutting back size. Right. Okay. So I think uh, I think that'll do it for today. Although I could go on, and I'm sure you could as well. Yeah. All right, Peter. It's been fun as usual. 
Yeah. Hey, thanks, Jack. As usual, we got to get together for breakfast or lunch here one of these days. Yeah, yeah. It's only a couple of hours uh, between us, so all we'll right. do it again. Yeah. Okay. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Jack, and thanks all for listening. Oh, take care. Bye. I'd like to thank Peter and Jack for allowing us all to be part of this dialogue. It has been a delight, as usual, to sit in and hear what's going on in both of your worlds. And I thank everyone again for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.